Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another interesting episode where we discuss very important Supreme Court judgment. And that is, of course, the case of Zambia Hotels Development Corporation trading as Fairview Hotel versus Ibrahim Motala. This is a 2002 decision that was delivered by the then Chief Justice in Golove. This case is important as it relates to the law of tort. Particularly, it comes from the thought of nuisance when we're discussing the tort of private nuisance. The case outlines two important principles. Number one, it espouses and recognizes sound or noise as a form of interference that would pin the defendant where they unreasonably produce the noise or the sound that end up having well, an inconvenience on another person's enjoyment of land. It also recognizes the rationale of the thought of nuisance that is to strike a balance between one person's enjoyment of land vis-a-vis another person's enjoyment of land. Well, interesting enough about the case is that it was heard as an appeal from the High Court following the decision that was given by the High Court judge, which was to the effect that, number one, well, the appellant in this case, which is Fairview Hotel, was found to have been tortiously liable in the thought of nuisance for the sound that was produced by them as they were of course the hotel as we'll find out more another thing uh, that was also a ground of appeal was the perpetual injunction that was given by the high court judge which was to the effect that the hotel was to no longer well produce or release any sound as it was causing, of course, an inconvenience on the respondent, who in this case is Motala. Well, the salient fact of this case were that the two parties were neighbors that were separated by a road. The appellant being an hotel, they had speakers on their terrace where they used to play sound. And of course, the idea behind this was for them to call more patrons, or rather customers, to flock to their hotel. On the other hand, this sound that was released and produced by the appellant had well, a substantial uh, inconvenience on the respondent. And of course, the respondent contended that they used to or have lots of inconvenience in that number one they would not even hear if dogs are barking so it was difficult for them to even tell if at all intruders came in in times they wouldn't even hear if visitors are actually knocking at the door so that being the case this is what led the high court judge to order a perpetual injunction which meant that the appellant was to stop producing that noise well in perpetuity meaning forever i agree by this decision of the high court that is what led them to well, appeal to the supreme court part of the further arguments that were actually given by the parties were that number one it was extremely going to be well of uh, a detrimental form on the part of the appellant if they were to stop producing the noise as the noise was well one of the way in which they were pulling more patrons to come so they were obviously going to have a huge financial loss if that were to be the case number two the well, appellant also averred that the respondents never really had a viable cause of action and this was to the effect that they were just overly sensitive 
and this was after the appellant had employed a noise expert who had concluded and submitted that well, a sound that would unreasonably be intolerable would be one well, reasonably be intolerable would be one that is at least exceeding 120. On the other hand, the respondent had also, well, interesting enough, uh, employed an expert witness also who well, had reached at a different conclusion, holding that sound that is reasonable would be one that is within the range of 81 decibels to 88 decibels. Well, that being the fact, the Supreme Court was left with two issues that they needed to, of course, discuss and say it. Number one was to whether or not to confirm the decision that was given by the High Court, which was to the effect that the, the, the appellant were tortiously liable in the thought of nuisance. And the second one was to find whether or not the the perpetual injunction that was given was, was was sound or it had sound legal backing. Well, to cut the story short, the Supreme Court found that the sound or the noise that was released by the appellant was not just too much but had an inconvenience on the a substantial inconvenience on the well, responded and that being the case, they were tortiously liable. Now, the Supreme Court needed to also create a balance in trying to find whether or not the perpetual injunction was really sound. That is within the legal means. So, trying to strike that balance, the Supreme Court took recourse from or an excerpt that was gotten from book, the book of the law of torts that was written by Clark. So, part of the principles that the Supreme Court had employed, number one, was to look at the principle of give and take, meaning it is not each and every single a claim, you know, any inconvenience that is caused by the actions of another that should be actionable in the tort of nuisance. And this is because of the, well, um, organized society in which we are in and it would be altogether absurd if each and every single well inconvenience that is actually caused is you know instituted in court as, as, as a viable cause of action on the other hand the supreme court also had to not just well away from the from the arguments that were given by both parties which was to the effect that, well, um, the sounds, that were, the noise that was measured in decibels uh, was at variance owing to the decisions or the submissions that were given by the expert witnesses or the expert, uh, the sound experts that were employed by both parties, the Supreme Court held that it was going to be absurd if they were going to create or form a specific you know, noise limit that is to be released by people. Creating that generalization was altogether going to be of, well, of, 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 was literally going to be unreasonable. And this was, of course, because number one, um, what would be taken to be an interference or a nuisance in one area won't be taken to be an interference in another area as this is really um, affected by a lot of factors, factors such as sensitivity, factors such as locality, such as, such as factors such as duration and that being the case they wouldn't uh, or they couldn't pinpoint well, a specific time limit that they were to use. The Supreme Court further went on now to create a balance in 
trying to find whether or not the decision that was given by the High Court following um, the decision that was the effect that the the the, the, the appellant were perpetually banned from releasing any noise. So in trying to strike a balance, well, the Supreme Court held that it was going to be of well, quite again absurd and quite unfair if the well, the appellants were perpetually banned from releasing noise. And in trying to strike that balance, the Supreme Court dwelled into the rationale that is behind the thought of nuisance. And that rationale is to strike a balance between one person's enjoyment of their land vis-a-vis -vis another. So their enjoyment of their land shouldn't be completely taken away but they should be able to enjoy their land within the reasonable limits so that they do not affect another person's enjoyment of their land. So it was going to be, of course, unfair if the defend if the appellants were to be, if, if they were going to perpetually and forever take away their right of playing sound or releasing noise on their land. More so, it was even going to be more detrimental in that they were going to have a financial loss as they were in business. So that being the case, the Supreme Court had to create that balance. And the balance that they had to create, number one, was to first by well, setting aside that decision that was given by the High Court and held that. Instead of playing sound or whatever way or releasing sound or whatever way that the appellants needed or used to, they rather substitute that uh, by holding that during weekdays they were to release the noise up to 21.30 and on weekends up to 22.30. And in events now where they would, where they would be caught or in events where they decide to go against that declaration or order that was given by the Supreme Court, well, where the respondent is just a claim in court, the the the, 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 the appellant would be pinned um, for for aggravated damages had they had or well, intentionally chosen to disagree or go against the guideline, the judgment that was given by the Supreme Court. That is what, well, obviously, uh, what was actually what was actually given uh, and, and ordered by the Supreme Court. Um, so from this case, altogether, we learn two important uh, principles, and one of the most uh, important principle that we learn is uh, the rationale of the law of nuisance. That is to strike balance between one person's enjoyment of their land which must be reasonable so as to ensure that it does not affect another person's enjoyment of their land. On the other hand, we also, and more so, 